Good morning, everyone. It's lovely to be back again with you, and uh, I've had uh, some nice conversations throughout the week with some of you, with people who heard, and also with myself, thinking about what I was going <laughs> to tell you and thinking about some of the questions that were asked. It's just great to have this kind of a community interaction. And um, so thank you for being here. And uh, I um, see that there's some uh, new faces, some uh, friends who were not here last week. So I was intending to do this in any case, a brief overview of what we went through the first time. But I think it might be helpful to just extend that a little bit and uh, give a basic context. Um, in which I propose that we think about how Rumi is interpreting the Quran. So just overall, uh, last week I um, talked about what the Quran is, who Rumi is, and then I also talked about storytelling and spe especially storytelling's place in the life of human beings from a perspective of cognitive science and uh, the new study of the place of narrative in uh, human beings' um, um, quest for meaning. Um, and I think, just briefly speaking, in terms of stories and narratives, that narratives pervade everything that we do, from our dreams, we wake up, we make sense of the dream, somebody asks us what we're doing, we tell a story in which we select a few points and make a narrative out of it. We watch TV or, you know, people are trying to tell us a story about what we need in order to live a happy life, advertising, then we watch. Um, you know, sports and the commentators are telling us a story of the people who are competing and, uh, you know, Olympics. So it's just basically our lives are kind of, you know, uh, lived in and through narratives, um, which has significance for our topic. And uh, part of which is that Rumi is a master storyteller. And one of the things that he does is that he interprets stories or explains stories from the Quran by telling other stories. So stories through stories. And uh, I think one of the findings of, um, um, I think, combination of uh, literary studies and um, the sciences of human cognition, I think they tell us that this is not surprising because human beings, contrary to what we used to think, you know, we like to think that we're rational creatures. But in fact, um, by definition, almost 97, some people say, up to 97% of our uh, thinking, our perception takes place unconsciously. There are these mechanisms that just do it, you know. They make meaning for us and there's no escape from it and then it rises to consciousness. And I um, suggested a very simple way of being able to um, connect with that and to make sense of this claim based on our own experience because it's important and uh, really valuable to test any idea that somebody offers us. Um, it's this idea of felt sense that I have used for myself now, and I teach in my courses at Marlborough, which is a, you know, a very writing-centered place. And uh, a big challenge in writing and creating anything is to make sure that you know, we're bringing as much of ourselves to the process as we can. So you know, studies of creativity and people who specialize in it, through experimentation, figure out a method that works for them. Usually it is working consciously on something and then going to sleep on it, right? We know it, let's sleep on it and see how things sort out. So obviously something is going on, which is we are not privy to, our conscious mind is not privy to, that sorts and organizes information that we put into it and that is also part of ourselves. So this idea of felt sense um, asks us to make a very simple uh, observation uh, by reflecting on our experience that when you're trying to talk to someone to express something, or when you're trying to write and you're looking for certain words, and you have the experience of saying, this is not it, this is not it, this is not it, and then you're like, yes, that's it. So the simple observation, the question is, against what are we judging the correctness of the word? There's obviously something inside us that already knows, and we're trying to express that. So that's, I, I find, a very helpful way of being very quickly being able to uh, understand the claims being made by the new sciences. But these claims also, I think, uh, were made by psychoanalysis. And before psychoanalysis, these claims were made by what I would call spiritual psychologists. So people like Rumi, who would be found in any tradition, who paid a lot of attention to how human beings lived their lives. We tell ourselves a certain story 
but in fact, there's multiple other kinds of things at play. We might tell ourselves that we're going someplace to do X, Y, and Z, and yet our motivations might be different. And we are really good at being able to sometimes cover over those kind of motivations. So obviously, there's multiple layers there, many different things going on. Um, so that was one of the points I made, uh, tried to bring across in the first uh, uh, talk last week, <clears throat> was the prevalence of stories, but how stories are not just conscious, there are stories that are being told at multiple levels within ourselves, And we will see the relevance of that to one of the ways in which Rumi asks us to think about scripture. And the other um, uh, thing I looked at and the question that I faced at the beginning of um, thinking about these talks was, how do I make this accessible? And that's, I think, as an educator, as somebody who teaches in college, and who now primarily receives more students, I feel, who are coming out of a non-religious background than ever before. So folks who um, I, cannot, I can no longer, as a professor of religion, count on somebody having read the Bible, for example. Um, so when I take a poll and stuff, a lot of the things that I used to take for granted 10 or 15 years ago even are no longer uh, part of um, the combined knowledge of the students in the group that I will be studying with. So, I mean, one can interpret that in many different ways, but just as an educator and as somebody who wants to um, both teach but also learn along with my students, um, it raises a very interesting question is how does one then bring across traditions or texts to which the other person is not yet uh, privy, like there's no um, baggage or there's no previous information they're bringing in. So it's really good in some ways, right, that some of the accepted are, you know, because uh, this is the other thing, I, you know, so some of you are here that I've had this conversation with, but I realized this upon coming to the U.S. many years ago, how allergic some people's reactions to the word religion are. <laughs> so as soon as you say something like God or something, all of a sudden it's like somebody breaks out in hives, you know? <laughs> and, you know, for many reasons, some justify it. I mean, who, who, who can deny somebody's uh, traumatic experience, perhaps, of what was done to them in the name of God? So, I, you know, I don't intend to just uh, make fun of that. I think there's real reasons for that. But at the same time, there's also, from my perspective, I feel that we lose out on a lot if we were to stick simply with our allergic reaction, if we are allergic to uh, what we might call religion and the language of religion, God talk, you know, as theology is called by um, some uh, philosophers and theologians. So that's part of the work for me. I feel like there's a lot of value, a lot of thinking and a lot of experimentation that has been done by people who use that language that is still very, very applicable to us because they're really talking about the human being, they're talking about the human self, and they're talking about the human self confronting the world and the problems all of us face at all times. So there's something perennial about these problems. And if we close ourselves off just because of some bad experiences we had with religion, then we are also shutting ourselves off to a big source of human wisdom in many, many different traditions. So what I'm proposing, and this is what I tried to do in the last lecture, was to try and help us see together how religion, as a general category, um, can be seen as one answer that societies have come up with in many different places to the question of human living. And the primary question is, how do we live and how do we determine what is right, what is wrong, what is good? How do we determine what is worth striving for? How do we live with ourselves in a way that is not destructive? How do we live with others together, because we are social creatures, in a way that does the least amount of harm, if I can put it that way, the least amount of harm for everybody involved? So it's a really interesting, I mean, from an algebraic or mathematical perspective, it's an equation with multiple variables, which all of us, all of them have to be satisfied in order to come up with a solution that works for most of the people. So it's not going to be a perfect solution. So that would be one thing that I would offer, again, as a reminder that in thinking about um, these past traditions, let us not ask perhaps for too much. You know, let's ask for what we can get from it, that this is a group of people, this is individuals inheriting material from their culture and then working out, figuring out how to live, uh, how to live life. 
And in doing that, in that larger question I proposed and I offered the example of um, uh, one example from Islam and then specifically thinking about Islamic ritual and the symbolism of the Kaaba as a way to think about um, one of the big problems that all of us face, which is that just like the Kaaba, so the Kaaba, you know, it's the center of the Islamic world. It's said to be built by Abraham and before that by Adam. And then the Kaaba at the time of Muhammad was filled with statues, idols, what you want to call them. And part of Muhammad's work was when he came in 600 CE, around that time period, 7th century, was to clean out that house of the idols. And it's called the house of God, Baytullah. That's the name of the Kaaba in the Islamic tradition. But the great thing about the Kaaba is as it stands right now, and I think how it's applicable to all of us, whether or not we think we're religious, whether we're atheists, no matter what it is, that it is, I think, a way in which we can conceptualize one of the biggest challenges of being human, which is that we live in bodies, we deal with bodies, we ingest bodies, we excrete certain bodies, you know, we are living through, and yet there are levels of our being that are also subtle and rarer than these bodies. So one of the issues and biggest problems is, in face of humans is how to use bodies in such a way, first of all, that is just, but then also not to be totally controlled by them. So the Kaaba, with its walls made out of stone, is empty inside. The house of God is empty inside. And for those who might, you know, Possibly it can be taken in a way that, you know, I, since this is being recorded, I'm sure like somebody might take a little snippet and say that, but why not, you know, it's going to happen in any case, so let me say that. Some people might really enjoy it and take it in a wrong way, but at the center of a Muslim's life is an emptiness. <laughs> so if you were to take it positively, like there's nothing of value there, no, that is exactly of what is value according to Rumi and according to uh, the great uh, spiritual psychologists that the Kaaba stands as a symbol of the human heart. Rumi says very beautifully, if there was not the heart, what use is the Kaaba? The Kaaba is for the sake of the heart. And in his uh, analysis of causality, the Kaaba did not come first. The human heart came first. And then to represent that, the Kaaba was built. So really what is being spoken about is the experience of us living our lives. So, um, David Foster Wallace, um, the late novelist and scholar as well, he uh, says something really uh, amazing, which I feel could have come out of um, um, pre-modern treatise, Islamic treatise as well, or some other traditions too. He says that, and this, this he said in his speech to graduation speech to Kenyon College, and he was talking about, he said that in the real everyday trenches, in the everyday trenches of real life, there is nothing called atheism. So he was taking a non-theological perspective, he's taking a process-oriented perspective, and he says that all of us end up serving something, and that's exactly the definition of God in Arabic dictionaries. What we serve, what is at our center, that which controls us, is our God. He says, worship power, and try and get a lot of power, and you will never have enough. Worship beauty, and as age starts to come, you know, you will, you know, be dying a hundred deaths before, uh, you know, uh, one actually dies. You know, worship something else, you know, knowledge and stuff, and you will always feel like you don't have enough. That's our dilemma, right? We are moved and attracted by things, and yet, how do we figure out not to be totally controlled by the things that are attracting us? So, this is one of the problems that uh, I think religion is offering. How to live a life that is free of the things that we do need. At the level of things, physical things, and then at the inner plane, at the level of meaning. Even ideas can become gods, right? And this is what we call an ideology. is when an idea has become the god and is trying to really control us. So I offered... Uh, I think last week, the image of the five times daily prayer where you hear God is greater. So God is a placeholder, the reminder is one solution, if we were not to 
talk in purely pragmatic terms of reminding us that no matter what we are engaged in, there's something bigger than that. So five times a day you hear the call to prayer, Islamic countries, and you're supposed to leave everything you're doing and literally go and wash your hands. You know, you clean your nose, wash your mouth, wash your face, wash your hands all the way up to your elbows and your feet. You're literally washing yourself out of what you were doing, no matter what it was. And you go and you stand and face the Kaaba and you remind yourself, ideally, of both the need for the wall and you face the emptiness inside. And then what happens when you're done? You come back to things again. Because that's life. We are in things, we're made of things, we work with things, work with ideas at all levels, and then we also have to be free of them as well, not to be totally controlled by them. So that's the dance. That's one basic you know, question that any human being has to solve. So we can think of the Islamic answer to that is that five times a day, a reminder, an actual practice in which we involve our body and try and think of that which is beyond anything. And that's a remarkable achievement in some ways, I would say. You know. So that's one way to think about it. And I hope that those of you here and those who might uh, hear it through uh, electronic means can um, appreciate the larger issue behind, the basic question I think that all humans have to deal with at all times. And that Islamic religion in this case, and in this case Rumi's understanding of it, provides one way of being able to see a human answer to it. The question will remain. And that's, and I think, you know, we talk about how um, discovering the question is sometimes more important than the answer. And you will hear Rumi's answer. But really, I think it's important to be able to think about what is it that he is trying to um, um, bring our attention to. And I think the thing that he's trying to bring our attention to is fairly obvious, right? It's obvious that we are here and we, we are going somewhere. So the question becomes, how do we want to go? In what manner do we want to go? And uh, what kind of vehicles do we want to use? So that image of... Um, the image of um, journey, the metaphor of a journey, is a really primary metaphor among the metaphors such as, um, you know, warm is good, more is up. They are so deeply grounded that they're prior to when our thinking mind comes. So babies, for example, associate warmth with goodness to be held. So there's something about our beings, something about the way we understand the world that has already been shaped prior to language kicking in, prior to ideas kicking in. And this is one of the things that I think contemporary uh, students of uh, um, human uh, you know, perception and um, human cognition are trying to point towards. And that's another example of thinking about how some of our processes are so deeply embedded that they're prior to language, literally prior to language. So language does not determine everything in this case. So the primary image is one of journey. We, just like in this world, we move from one place to the other, you know, and if I wanted to move over there and this tool is in the way, I just pass it along. It's an obstacle, but I've overcome it. So that's simple, just like warm is good and more is up and cold feels down and, you know, just like you see, we say, I'm depressed, meaning I'm feeling down when we are feeling good, we are standing up straighter, you know. So these are literally in our body, these basic metaphors. So religion, religious texts, scriptures, a lot of times use these kind of metaphors that are so common and hence are also translatable across cultures. I would propose that, you know, almost all humans, I would say, you know, think that warm is good, you know, cold is not. <laughs> Within relativity, of course, you know, somebody who grew up to be, you know, in Antarctica or something might have a different relation to cold, but yet they try and keep themselves warm. Warm is still good even over there. So we can speak, I think, meaningfully in a restricted way within bounds of certain universals. So that's the way in which I'm uh, hoping to bring across some of what Rumi has to say. Um, one other point is really worth mentioning, I think, before we get to the exact topic of today's talk, which is um, <coughs> that um, meaning and perception 
is determined to a large degree by the story. So if we think we're living a certain story, we're a certain character, we tend to think the world in that way. And I think a strong form of that is that all meaning is determined by our perception. All meaning is determined by the metaphors that we're living, by the story we are telling ourselves. Um, which, while being true to a degree, I think that kind of a strong position is also going a little too far. Because the reason that we can become aware that a story is lacking or a metaphor only gets at one side of an issue is that we have observed more than one side to it. So our perception is actually not totally determined by language or culture, which is interesting and an important point to remember. So paradigms in science terms, for example, shift because we become aware of something, some data, that the theory is unable to explain. And I don't know if I said this in the previous lecture or not, but I was reminded that I, it should be mentioned that since we're dealing with Rumi, and he's the kind of um, thinker who likes us to reflect on our own experience and dreams are a really important part of our life experience and I'm sure all of us have had the experience sometime at least in our dreams where we watch ourselves doing something and I think I would propose and this is the way it's under understood that that part of ourselves that is doing the watching is the same part that becomes aware of the shortness or the shortfalls of any theory or any story or any metaphor. So there's ways in which we're aware of this already that we are not totally determined by our circumstances. There's something there that is beyond the stories that we're living, that is beyond the language that we used to think, that is beyond the um, words in that language or the relationships in that language. There's something about the human being that is not socially determined. There's a lot about us that is socially determined, for sure. The clothes I'm wearing right now, the language I'm speaking, many, many, many things. But it would be incorrect to say that we are totally determined. And this is a huge difference. Because all of, um, especially spiritual psychology and the practice, is about strengthening that part and making us realize that we are more than what we think we are. And um, in some texts, and this is not Rumi specifically, but one of his, uh, another really great Muslim thinker, Al-Ghazali, he talks about that scripture is addressing that part of ourself, the one that sees in the dream, the one that is able to see the shortcoming of something, the one that's slightly more, let's use that word, objective, even towards ourselves. We can see ourselves in a certain way, so we can have a distance from ourselves. And even language is quite, quite funny, uh, I think, funny, illuminating in that way where we use, just think of how we use the word language, like, you know, you do something and you're like, especially these days, we are um, being, uh, I think, led to that place where we do something that we don't want to do, and you, I don't know, maybe it's clicking on something, on our ad, or on your phone, and you're like, I can't believe I did that. And the op starts in the video, I don't know, it's on YouTube or something, you know, and you do something, I can't believe I did that. What does that say about us? How many yous are there? You know, how many uh, eyes are there who are there? But obviously our experience is that there are different levels of this, different drives or whatever you want to call it. And I think different ways of thinking about it will characterize them differently. And if you were to ask uh, contemporary psychologists, they might talk about subpersonalities. You know, if you were to talk to a, um, just a biologist, you know, a neuroscientist, they would talk about drives within, you know? If I don't eat anything for about 24 hours, my survival drive and my drive to eat takes over. It doesn't matter, you know, what I think I might be doing. It's going to bring me to the fridge or someplace. And there you go. You have become that very thing. But at this moment right now, all of those drives are there. But because their needs have been met, you know, my temperature is being regulated, you know. You know, I'm married, so, you know, those needs are met. I have children, all this stuff. And so things are in equilibrium. There's a way in which each person, each one of us, is a conglomeration, like a coming together of many different, in some ways, competing drives. You know, the food part wants food. You know, the heat part wants heat. And, you know, we have doctors in the house. And the hypothalamus, right, it's, it's right below here. <laughs> And it is controlling all of it. I'm not aware of it. You know, you might go to the fridge and after a while you'll be like, whoa, did I just finish whatever it was, you know, that <laughs> you thought you're going to save later or something, I'm sure, you know, you know. Or you sit in front of uh, the TV and you, you know, I don't know, 
this happened to me the first time I ate actually a pint of ice cream. I was like, wow, what, what just happened? I was just watching and you, know, you just keep on going and you know, you're unaware and you finish a whole pint of ice cream and then you're like, <laughs> wow. So, so who am I, right? Who are you? Who are we? Where's this, all of these uh, things there? Rumi's friend, you know, Shams, he talks about this. He says, you think you are one, but look at yourself. You are just so many different things scattered all over the place. So that would be another way of thinking about, right? We're just like all over the place. Another way of thinking about religion and then specifically um, contemplative practice and ritual is that it's a way of organizing, harmonizing different parts of ourselves into a working whole such that the needs of all of the constituencies can be met in a certain way. Just like society is being structured, right? So this microcosm and macrocosm, the microcosm of the body and the macrocosm of the society, this way of thinking about it is fairly old. You know, you find it in the earliest texts as well, to use our experience within our own bodies, our own psyches, as a way to think about how it is that larger entities that are also composed of those bodies are, are um, organized. And William Gass, uh, the short story writer, he has a beautiful sentence about uh, a well-crafted sentence. He says a well-crafted sentence is like a polity where multiple constituencies we each with their own demands has been satisfied and each is living next to each other in a nice harmonious way and adding to an amplitude, right? I mean, it's a beautiful image of what a harmonious sentence can do. The verb wants to control the, you know, or the adverb wants to go over there and then there's a noun and adjectives want like call it a profound experience, not just experience. Isn't it a profound experience, right? <laughs> the red bell, why just call it bell, the red bell? I mean, immediately in the mind of a writer, you start thinking like all these competing demands. It's happening all the time, you know? Um, yeah. So that was a summary of basically the last <laughs> lecture. But it's more than a summary because I think it's, it's um, one of the things that I've learned as I've, um, you know, um, taught on for years is that, and I've started to teach my students this as well, it's very good to, in writing a paper, once you've written the first draft fully, then to just put it aside and then outline from memory. That which is important will stay and that which was superfluous will disappear. If it was not important, then, you know, so this is, it's a way of building trust within ourselves and, you know, so now speaking to you, all of that stuff came. So in a sense, it was, you know, important, I guess. So it's not a problem to <laughs> um, speak about it again. So today's lecture specifically is titled uh, Quran, Map of the Self. And uh, this uh, is my way of, um, of summarizing or giving a title to what I see as um, some points that uh, Rumi is making. And let me just read a couple of quotes from him about this. Yes. yes, so to connect it back to um, the point I made that one of the basic ways in which we think of our lives, life of other, is life as a journey. And this is a basic metaphor that is also used, the basic image that is also used in the Quran. So five times a day Muslims pray, and in each prayer they're required to recite the Fatiha, which is called the beginning or the opening. It's the first chapter of the Quran, short chapter. So even if you don't know Arabic, every, person, every Muslim is required to memorize it. And it begins by giving thanks to God, recognizing God's existence, so in the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. Uh, the owner of the day of reckoning, the owner of the day of, uh, you know, uh, judgment. You alone we serve and you alone we ask for help. Guide us on the straight path. The path of those who have been blessed, not the path of those who have gone astray, nor those who have brought down your wrath. So that is the basic metaphor. So given that the Quran was revealed in a desert setting where the guide of the caravan would really, everybody's life depended on that guide. So God is being seen as the guide in this path of life. And life, um, three possibilities are presented. That there's a possibility of 
walking the path and becoming blessed, meaning finding your destination. The other possibility is imagine in a desert getting lost by following the wrong signs and making wrong conclusions. And the other one thing is to do something while on the path that really actually uh, becomes a cause of destruction. Walking in such a way that you know, one uh, becomes uh, uh, worthy of punishment. So, though, so the path is the basic uh, image there. And um, for Rumi, the Quran um, is pointing, is full of those pointers. And uh, he calls the Quran, and I guess one other thing. Well, let me say this and then I'll uh, come to that. Um, the Quran, Rumi says, is a description of the states of the prophets. The fish in the pure ocean of the majestic God. So at one level, it is showing the inner states of, uh, the, the state of who the prophets are. So that's a possibility of human becoming, a way of walking the path of life. And the, on the other hand, while depicting the attitudes and acts of disobedient humans, the Quran clarifies the nethermost possibilities of human beings. And this is what Rumi says. The entire Quran is an explanation of the viciousness of the egos. Look in the holy book. Where is that eye of yours? So it's giving us the whole spectrum. So I see it as being mapped onto the basic imagery of the path walking a path in the desert and the possibilities there. There are those who, you know, um, are acting viciously and, you know, vicious acting is going to bring vicious responses. I mean, we see it among, the, among ourselves, right? That, you know, you speak softly to somebody, you're more likely to get a soft response. A vicious person inevitably ends up getting some kind of a comeuppance. And then there's the other possibility of the prophets. Human beings, let's just call them exemplars, human beings who seem to be able to flow through life in an ideal way. So that's the question, once again, to take it out of the religious terminology. The question is how to live this life, how to live this life in a way that is um, harmonious, flowing, and how to live a life, or how not to live a life that you know, will lead to uh, destruction, so to speak. Um, so when he's telling uh, stories, you know, at the microcosmic level of the human self, he says that these stories in the Quran, Rumi says, the stories of the prophets and their adversaries, they are the ready cash. Ready cash, not a credit card that we're carrying around. Cash in hand that you can spend right there. It's, it's really the value. And in those days, I guess there was no paper money, so we're really talking about gold, right? So there's no, no saying that, you know, this, take this as a promise for something that's sitting somewhere else and somebody is promising. Not all of that is taken out. It is the thing right there. There is no separation between the value and the thing that's representing that value. This story is not a story. It is a description of a state. So I've talked about this briefly, but you know, an excellent example of the way in which Rumi interprets Quranic stories of the prophets is found in the extended treatment he gives to the various episodes of the story of Moses and Pharaoh. So it's the same Pharaoh, the same story as in, in the Bible, it's told slightly differently in the Quran, and it told multiple times. The Quran is a very interesting text in that it, we know how it was revealed because it's in the light of history. And the way in which it was revealed is re revealed in a very dialogic fashion, very much like we are having this conversation. So just like the way I told the same things in last week's lecture, right, were slightly different, and then I told them again, they're slightly different. So one get, gets exactly the same sense. So some of the stories are told multiple times, and different aspects of the story are focused on depending on the needs of the audience, perhaps, or the needs of the discourse, or the aims of the speaker at that moment. So this is the same Moses and Pharaoh that we are familiar from the Hebrew Bible. So Rumi sees Pharaoh as representing the rebellious human self that exceeds all bounds in its obstinacy and its quest for total power and control. See, worshiping the god of power, control. I am the god. I am the, uh, nothing should happen without me knowing it. 
Sometimes it's really great being around little kids, you know. You see <laughs> the little pharaoh, you know, the little tyrant, he was like, no, it should be happening this way, you know. And then you see the kids bossing around their friends in games. Some people really like to do that. It's, yeah, kids' games are really lovely to be able to see these stories playing themselves out. And be the beauty of it also there is that it's just so innocent, right? There's, they have not yet learned to hide it like we do, right? They have not put those, oh, all of us, I mean, it's the same things, right? The need for... We do need to control things. Who likes to be just being tossed around on the waves? So a control is an important thing, you know? And yet, what we are learning, and through those games, and this is part, I think, of uh, kids playing, we are learning how to live together and exercise control in a way, again, that is beneficial for everybody, ideally, right? And that's, that's the usefulness of games. And that's the usefulness of telling stories as well, that in stories we see somebody playing that game and we tend to learn from it. Um, he develops part of this Moses and Pharaoh story to do, illustrate the many qualities of the lower self, the ego, and contrast it with the station of the prophets as a way to help readers to know and interpret the structure and content of their own souls, their own interiority. So now this is a quote for Rumi. Rumi says, the mention of Moses serves as a mask, but the light of Moses is your ready cash. The mention of Moses serves as a mask, but the light of Moses is your ready cash. Moses or Pharaoh are in your own being. You must seek these two adversaries in yourself. Moses and Pharaoh are in your own being. You must seek these two adversaries in yourself. So, the ready cash of our state, these stories. You must seek these adversaries within yourself. Um, so the Quran, as a historical document, revealed, according to Islamic understanding, to Muhammad, a certain human being, over a period of certain periods of time. And its verses are called ayat, A-Y-A-T. It's a, a singular ayat. It literally means sign. You know, Brattleboro, two miles or something like that. That kind of a sign, you know, ayat. So the verses of the Quran are called ayat or signs. And then there are, but it's being revealed by God to Muhammad. And the Quran calls natural phenomena also as signs. They're also ayat. Don't you see the signs of God in X, Y, and Z kind of a natural thing? A sign for you, for example, is a very common phrase. A sign for you is the honeybee, how it creates you know, wholesomeness and goodness from X, Y, and Z. So there's many, many different things. A sign for you is how God sends the winds. They bring clouds that rain down on parched earth. And look, out of deadness, life arises. So that's a sign. So sometimes a sign is just a thing, and sometimes a sign is a series of related phenomena. So we have two sets of signs. One are in the book that is called the Quran, which is linguistic. The other are natural phenomena, what is outside. And it also, the Quran says that what is happening within our interiority within our souls within our selves the arabic word is nafs within ourselves are also signs so there's a really important quranic verse that sets up the relationship between these three sets of signs in which uh, god says um, we shall show them meaning humans our signs in the horizons outside world and within their own selves until they know that it is the real, that uh, what they're encountering or what is the real. So here we get the three books that are spoken of in uh, uh, Islamic uh, thinking, but also we find similar uh, ideas in uh, uh, medieval Christian uh, writers as well, the idea of the three books. So in the Quranic framework, though, the three books are the book of Revelation, which is the Quran, the book of the horizons or the book of the world and the book of the soul or our self. So another 
really interesting way in which the Quran builds on this idea of the book is in speaking about um, the day of reckoning. So I spoke about that first chapter of the Quran that Muslims recite in the five times daily prayers. You know, in the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. The owner of the day of reckoning or the day of judgment. So in describing that day of judgment, there are certain instances given. They, it's like a foreshadowing, like a little, you know, there's flashbacks and flash forwards. The Quran is a really great text in that way. There's lots of flashbacks and flash forwards. The, in one of the flash forwards, we find ourselves at the day of reckoning. And God is speaking to uh, the soul as it's standing to account. And God says to the soul, read today your own book. It suffices you. It is enough for you. Read today your own book, which is paired with this understanding that our lives, ourselves, are books that we are writing. So that's the image that is being used to think of living a life, is writing a book. And one of the things that the Quran is asking us to consider, like other traditions, you know, there's the idea of the mirror of karma in Buddhism, that at the moment of death, we must encounter ourself and everything that is within the self in that moment. That is, it's a similar idea that on that day of reckoning, we have to reckon with, we have to face ourself. But it's being spoken of and thought of in terms of a book. So we will have to read our own book. So the revelation is sent as a way to be able to decipher the signs within our own selves as well. So this is where Rumi is bringing us to. He wants us to focus on what is happening right now, and hence the idea of ready cash. It's not something that's going to happen tomorrow or day after. When you hear the story of Moses and Pharaoh, it is describing, you know, we were talking about those sub-personalities perhaps, or those drives, depending on what frame we put on it. You know, we can put a biological frame, we can think of these as drives. We can put a psychological frame and think of these as sub-personalities. Um, but we know that our uh, brain converts uh, feeling and what might be called biological energy into images, right? What else are dreams otherwise? <laughs> they are a transformation or a picturization of what is our flowing within our body, the energy that is flowing within our body. So from that perspective, there really is no distinction. It has different modes of the appearance of the one same thing, which is us. We are one and we are many and we see in different ways. Um, so that's what Rumi is trying us, uh, telling us, that that is what the Quran is. That's the way we ought to think of the Quran, and especially the stories in the Quran, that when we see those characters, it's actually talking about us. So we need to figure out the Pharaoh inside us. How do we figure that out though, right? We look at what Pharaoh did, and we see which part of us is doing that. What was Moses doing? And I think there's a whole, I'm going to give a whole talk on uh, Moses and Pharaoh one, but you know, Moses is a really interesting character. He's a very uh, complicated character, like all prophets. Not all prophets, I mean, it's hard work, right? Who wants to go back to the person in whose house you were <laughs> brought up, you know, where you killed a man, you ran off, and now you're living a life of exile, so to speak, and you have found some sort of peace in the wilderness being a shepherd, right? And all of a sudden, this being appears and says, all right, go back and face Pharaoh. But it's fascinating, and, and it's a little bit of a preview of what goes. In the Quranic version, you know what God says to Moses? Go to Pharaoh and speak softly with him. It's a really remarkable uh, statement. It's not go to Pharaoh and read him the riot act. <laughs> right? Not go to Pharaoh and say that God is about to destroy you. Even to that being, God is telling Moses to speak softly. And Moses cannot stand it. Why would I speak softly to him? Like perhaps God says he will understand. It's a really interesting moment. We'll dwell on that a little bit later. But it's a dynamic, the way the Quran is presenting it. And when Rumi is looking at another, you know, Muslim thinkers are looking at it. And just even a reader of the Quran, the question arises, you know, there's a Moses in me and there's a Pharaoh in me. And the Moses in me who is righteous and who has been wronged by this Pharaoh still needs to reach out and speak softly to Pharaoh. It's pretty crazy. It's not just let my people go. It's like speak softly and then, you know, talk it out 
and see. So it's not war immediately. It is. There's a process involved there in the Quranic picture. All right, so let me stop there for, for this section and take any questions. Yes, please. So you are speaking of Pharaoh and Moses, and in my mind, um, what, what my you know, reading experience is, I think of Pharaoh as a representation of absolute power. Is that? Uh, yes, absolute power, but more than that, it's a desire for absolute power and also that part of us that desires that power because he obviously needs to keep everything under check right for the sake of wanting to have a certain state of affairs so but then to go to moses I, I, my point was there to me i don't say it, it's somewhat clear or obvious yeah Right, yeah. So you say he's very complicated, and I, I feel like I don't really understand the relationship or what Moses represents. Yes. I mean, I, I, I can say a few things in a nutshell. So the question is that um, um, there's um, a desire to know a little bit more about what Moses represents. I think Moses is, re is representing... Uh, the prophetic part of our being, the part that is called to speak the truth and stand up against and bear witness against tyranny. Really, right? And that is the part also that um, needs to, that is in need of guidance as well. So it, that part needs to connect with something that's bigger than itself as well. And I think what is being pointed out, and this is what I mean in terms of complicated about Moses, is that that part of ourselves in this story, and we see that in other biblical stories too, like in the story of Jonah, runs away from what needs to be done. So there's a complication there, and I think that's one of the reasons why this is helpful for Rumi's purposes, that he will point out that it's not simply, it's not a black and white picture. And one of the things he does, Rumi does, along with some, many other Muslim thinkers as well, is he also complicates Pharaoh's character, as we will see. Pharaoh is also somebody who's not just pure will to power. There are moments where, you know, even God desires Pharaoh to actually be able to receive the message. God wants in the Quranic picture. Why would God ask Moses to speak softly with him, right? So the narrative is pointing that possibility. So no one is forever damned in this picture. It's not like everything is set. It might play out a certain way, but there's a way in which things reach their ends. So Moses is very complicated, especially once we start to understand it on our own inner plane. The part of us that sees the need to stand up to something might run away and decide to become a shepherd <laughs> and not want to come back <laughs> and, and face the tyrant. Because a fascinating thing here, and this is really interesting too, is such a strange thing, like in the Moses story, that Pharaoh, out of fear, kills all of these young newborn baby boys because he doesn't want to lose power. What a horrific act to do. I mean, one cannot imagine it, right? But then, look at the irony of life. The one who's about to bring him down grows up in his own household. Grows up as a prince within his own household. Who then discovers who he is, kills an Egyptian, and flees. So Moses owes his, uh, you know, growing up to Pharaoh in a worldly fashion. And Pharaoh actually reminds him of that in the Quranic story. <laughs> like, you are ungrateful, he says, coming back to me and telling me this. Weren't you a part of us? Weren't you one of us? So it's a very complicated picture in that way. So that's where these stories, I think, get their value and their, um, their potency, really. Because, and I think I cited, uh, you know, the great Turkish uh, author, Rafiq Algan, who's also a student of Sufism, and uh, him, uh, my conversation with him about, um, about stories and he talked about how one of the reasons why stories are so used in scripture and then also in following scripture are so used in uh, teaching discourses by Muslim contemplative Sufis is that they make sure that the listener stays active. They're like yeast that is thrown in. Our mind, because of the way it is structured, the neural pathways, 
we end up just, we have no way other than to ask ourselves, like, what happened to that character? I wonder what happened at that moment. And so it's not a closing down, it's an opening up of things. So stories, and this is a lot of what Rumi and other um, thinkers do in interpreting the stories. They will retell it, or they will take one small detail and blow it up. So, you know, there are things in Rumi's uh, poetry, the places in his poetry where he spends time in discussing things that are never mentioned in the Quran, only hinted at, but he makes it bigger and develops it. So it's a populating, it's a bringing yourself into those stories and enlarging them, magnifying them, making us relate to them even better. Yeah. Yes, Ken. Yes. Yeah. Right. And it's just interesting that he takes his speaking soft voice from his voice that he's hearing all his life he's growing up from his mother. Yeah. The adopted mother, yes, yeah. So Ken is pointing out that Ken is pointing out that in the Quranic story, um, it is Pharaoh's wife, whose name is Asiya, uh, who finds Moses and uh, convinces Pharaoh to uh, raise him as one of his own and she is put up as a model uh, human being in the Quran on par with the prophets really I mean the words that are used to um, describe her are fascinating and her uh, closeness to God is remarkable there's a uh, verse in which she, she prays to God when she sees what Pharaoh is doing asking her to be absolved of his actions and asking God to build a house for her next to her, next to him, which is a remarkable kind of a uh, closeness that she had. So that verse is uh, the subject of a lot of uh, thinking by, um, you know, an interpretation by uh, contemplatives because they point to her station as a really elevated station and uh, as somebody who was very close to the truth, close to reality. Yes. So that household was not simply, yes, Ken, you're right in pointing out that Pharaoh's household was not devoid of all uh, beauty. I mean, it's just remarkable. This guy who's doing such terrible things is married to what we would call a saint, literally, by the Quranic uh, standards, the way she's described. So he grew up with his adopted mother, that the one who was caring for him was somebody of that kind of a spiritual stature, who was living within the um, sort of the cradle of uh, this power structure and somehow was not contaminated by it. So again, right, a story. It's another element in the story and then we can see just because of the fact that one might be privileged doesn't mean that one has to bear the burden, you know. You know, there's, certain, there's, there's ways of being free of our situation, not being totally determined by it, you know. Yes. That's, yeah, it's, it's mentioned more in, um, in, in, in the Bible, not as much in the Quran. It's Moses' sister who sees, and I think the, the Quranic, exactly, yeah, yeah, I think um, the Quranic story as well uh, points out, and I think the later traditions fill that, that in a little bit, that when Moses was found, his sister followed the ark in which Moses was and saw the discovery, went and told the mother, and then uh, Pharaoh's wife, Asiya, tried to find a wet nurse to nurse this infant, and Moses refused everybody's breast and only took on his real mother. So that was a way in which God actually made sure that his real mother was also, it does complicate, yeah. So he had his wet nurse and his adopted mother who was overseeing it, yeah. yeah. Remarkable, yes. Any other questions before we? Break? Yes. When you were talking about how Muslims go to prayer five times a day, I Ideally, Muslims go to prayer five times. It's just, I mean, we, we're talking about this ideal scenario here, but you would talk to Muslims and, you know. <laughs> but it made me wonder if it, you know, this meditation wave that's passing through right now, and everybody seems to be meditating, could it be compared to the, the going to prayer? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Everything drops out of your mind. Exactly. Yeah. And you just are there. 
Yeah. yeah. Right, right. Would there be a comparison? I think absolutely. So the question is, can one compare meditation because there is a big move towards meditation and it has gaining more place in our culture. Can it be compared with that five time um, kind of an activity? And for sure, I think in many, many ways, it is doing the same thing. It is bringing our, uh, first of all, carving out a time, even if it is once a day, I think that's you know, one is infinite, infinitely more than nothing, you know, as I like to remind myself <laughs> and students as well, you know, write one sentence and then you have written infinitely more than what you had written before, you know. <laughs> it's all relative ways of <laughs> motivating ourselves. Uh, so yeah, even if it is once, it's, uh, I think it's uh, very helpful. And uh, usually the principle of meditation is to find an anchor, either a bodily sensation, breath, or you know, an outward focus on something, to focus the mind, and it's a practice in letting go of whatever our minds attaches itself to. So we are able to see the nature of our mind, we're able to see the way in which we attach and become what we pay attention to, you know, and then letting go of it. So absolutely, in many ways, it's a training in that. But there are levels at which I think it falls short as well. I'm not saying meditation is not good, but just in comparison. First of all, the prayer happens through a communal call to prayer. Even if one is not going to pray, the sound reaches. And one thinks about that first phrase, God is greater, that idea that there's something greater. The other thing, and this is a much larger discussion and perhaps in a future iteration, uh, I think this might be a good topic to bring up. What is the relative benefit of an approach that is theistic in which one approaches the real, the ineffable, the infinite, as a personality versus simply training the mind without any such structure. So that's a question that's worth asking as well. And then the other thing is also the physical physicality involved, the washing of the hands. So just neurologically, one looks at um, how much of our brain is connected with the hands. It's fascinating. There's some old charts that tend to map on, that show um, in an exaggerated fashion how much of the brain is used to control how much of the body. And it's a, rem a huge number, like the percentage is just unbelievable how much is used to control our hands. Like the hands appear, if we were to, in relation, the hands appear this big compared to the rest of the body it's because, you know, we do stuff. So literally washing the hands, we know now, connects exactly with the brain. So I'm not saying that this, you know, um, is um, a definite proof, but to me, ritual, and I've, I've come on a whole journey in thinking about ritual in this way, that this kind of a ritual that operates socially so that there's actually a space created for it. So in a Muslim country, if you're somebody who wants to pray, when you hear the call to prayer, there's usually spaces everywhere where you can just pray. Over here to meditate, you know, it becomes a private affair. It's you. You're not connecting with others through it, you know. And... Um, then it works at the level of our body. Then at the very least, you know, you stand and you focus yourself on something and you're doing these bodily postures and there's a gentle stretching that happens with it. So there's actually a physical refreshment that takes place. It's a resetting, I feel, you know. So if one were to design a new ritual, that, those would be the requirements just based on this model. I would say, you know, that meditation is great, one should do it. But let's think of all of the stuff that's also missing in sitting just by ourselves and trying to train that. So that sitting by ourselves and just meditating, that's a lot of what some Muslim contemplatives do, but it's usually on top of everything else. It, it's a honing in, it's a, it's a finessing, it's, a, it's a, you know, making it more subtle and practicing that. So I think there's good ways in which we should ask religious traditions to challenge our ways of ordering society. It's something that I've become aware of, become really aware of keenly when I travel. The space, public space, and how much the responsibility is on the individual to do this thing that, you know, this could be quite beneficial. And I don't want to um, sweep away, um, you know, a lot of the negative consequences that can also come from religion, but, you know, those are also present with any kind of a system 
that uh, we use to organize ourselves and organize society. Every system has its benefits and its flaws. So um, I'm not presenting religion as a, I'm not trying to argue that that is the only path here, but I think there's a way in which we need to um, interrogate where we are and uh, in light of some of the solutions that were um, arrived at through a much longer process and an older tradition. So there's, there's value there, I think. So let's take a little break and uh, we'll come back and uh, yeah. I have a lot more I felt like I needed to cover, but um, you know, reality is a, a good uh, test. One thinks in one's mind of what one wants to do, and then the actual situation turns out to be quite different. Um, I don't know, maybe we'll have to extend the number of lectures, uh, you know. <laughs> see, I love it. See, 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 I knew it, so I need that gratifi gratification. <laughs> gratification as well so thank you this is great it is it's really lovely being here uh, with all of you so for this uh, second half I think which is going to be uh, fairly uh, short compared to the first one I, I wanted to uh, make two points one is to go back again and kind of uh, transition back to and then from this idea of the Quran being a depiction of the states um, to share with you one of um, uh, my discoveries, what I learned that helped me understand that, and hopefully that can be helpful to you as well, not just in terms of thinking about the Quran, but in thinking about you know, how we're journeying through life, uh, where we're going. And the other point I would like to make uh, is about uh, criteria that Rumi offers for determining whether one's interpretation is correct or not. Which is, I think, you know, really what we're working towards. His goal as well is ultimately to help all of us, uh, his readers, get to a place where they can move away from following authority to becoming authorities on their own self. This is not a path of trying to control others. And I think this is one of uh, the reasons why most of us immediately feel that in certain teachers people who are sharing things. There's people who try and display knowledge for the sake of a gain. And then there's people I feel, like Rumi, who really are trying to teach in order that the student can become the master as well. So I think for Rumi, um, the, the, what he's trying to teach us is to come to know our own selves and hence gain confidence in our abilities. And that's exactly, he would say, why we have been created, is to come to know ourselves and path with certainty. Um. Um. All right, maybe I'll just have, need to stand still. Okay. Maybe it's running out of battery. Or. All right. Well, I'll just need to maybe shout if something happens. Maybe it was just, it'll come loose. Yeah. All right. Um, right, so the path of verification, it's called by, um, uh, in the Islamic tradition. There's the path of imitation, which is just fine. Most of our are imitators in most of the things we do in life. We're all imitators when it comes to car technology. We're all imitators when it comes to, you know, toothpastes. And, you know, we trust in somebody else's authority. I mean, that's the issue, you know. And we have to trust. And, but there are certain things for which, you know, it's like, um, you know, you give an answer on an exam and the teacher says wrong. And you say, why don't you go in and ask that person? I just cheated off of that person. <laughs> <laughs> <They should be> <laughs> so at one level, there are certain things we are responsible for knowing. And that's, I think, another thing we need to uh, distinguish as we grow older and as we, you know, go through life is what are those things that nobody else can answer for, that only we can answer for, that only we can tell whether something is true or not. Yeah. So, um, um, so this is the path of uh, verification. Um, 
And um, the word for that is tahqiq uh, in Arabic, which comes from the root of haq. And haq means true or real, and it's a divine name as well. One of the names of God is the real, al haq And from that same root, we get haqiqa, which is reality. So in pre-modern times, when I was growing up in Pakistan, I learned the Urdu word for research, and it's called tahqiq, which is you know, the same word that Rumi and other uh, Muslim scholars use to talk about verification, but they're talking about the verification of certain other kinds of realities within our soul. Verification that, in fact, this story in the Quran or scripture is speaking to us and to verify the reality of that thing within. That's it. The truth, the reality of something. To ascertain it, that's a verification. Um, right, so to go back to the first point that I mentioned in talking about uh, and understanding Rumi's um, um, suggestion that the Quran is not something that happened in the past. It is the ready cash of our inner state. So what is our inner state? I was confused for a little while, um, not sure exactly how to understand this. But when one looks at Sufi treatises, writings by Sufis, there's a whole genre of them in which different stages of the path to God are listed. You know, there's a book that lists 100. There's another one that would list more than that. So it became a whole genre of writing where certain Sufi authors described what were the stages on the path to God. So again, the metaphor is the same. The journey as life. A stage is a place where the stage coach, right? The coach stops. We descend down to it. So it's a place. Another word for that they use is place or maqam. The different maqamat, the different places, the halting places, the way stations that one encounters on the way to God. And we're mapping on, in that way of understanding, we're mapping on an outward journey onto an inner journey. But obviously, interiorly, in our interiority, we're not going places. We're using, just like we use the metaphors, and this is, I think, what cognitive linguistics really helped me kind of piece together. We're using basic metaphors that we are just like, like pre-linguistic, like up is down, warm is good. Uh -huh. The idea of motion, grasping, understanding is to grasp something, seeing is believing, those kinds of things where they are pre-linguistic in our um, bodies. We use them to understand other domains of experience. So why would, the question that uh, existed for me for a few years was, why is it that these Sufi authors, these contemplatives and these scholars, when they're systematizing what's happening on the inside, why are they using this terminology to describe a state? Because the names of these stations, these halting places, were in fact states. So the beginning one is, uh, is usually called, or the beginning of the path to God comes through repentance. You become aware of some wrong and you decide to turn towards, in Arabic the word tawbah, repentance, literally means to turn towards. So the first stage is that you actually realize that you need to orient yourself. So, but that's also called a place, the place of repentance. But it's describing an inner state, right? So how to make sense of this? And like I said, cognitive linguistics is helpful in that because it solved for me uh, this uh, conundrum because we actually conceive of states as places. Interior states appear as places. So we fall into love or depression. So what we're doing is we're thinking of that state, the feeling, as a container. So a very basic you know, metaphor, again a pre-linguistic one, is seeing things in or out of a place. So we end up thinking of these feelings, stuff that we feel in our body, as a container. So we fall into love, we fall into depression. You know? So a state is a place. And I'm offering this as a way to be able to think about perhaps some other authors you might be interested in, or about our own experience. Um, because language reveals a lot about 
how we're thinking of something. So notice how we also speak of um, the experience of attunement as being in a space. So we speak about being in the moment, right? So it's this feeling of containment. So moment is not a space really, but our experience and our feeling in it is feeling like we are totally there and no part of us is outside. So we are in the moment, we're in the experience. So whatever we feel attuned to, we feel we're contained in. And there's no, no part of us that is left out. So it's helpful to, so I think, um, I find it very helpful to pay attention to this, to pay attention to language in this way, because what is uh, useful there, practically speaking, is to be able to use a feeling in one place and to be able to apply it to a different experience. So, for example, um, this is one that is really beautiful. Um, in experimenting with some of these ideas, a dear friend, former student, but really now he's a teacher in certain ways for music, Mike Harris. He and I have been teaching a series of courses over the last year at Marlborough College. And it is using singing as a way of meditating. Again, you know, trying to, the goal for me was to try and create a practice that was inviting for everybody. Those who are allergic to the word God and those who are also non-allergic, <laughs> you know? That a practice that can bring different people together, but yet becomes a space and a way through which we end up exploring these basic dimensions of being human. Um, so I have had no musical training, so it's been lovely to be a beginner and learning how to sing in tune. It's a remarkable experience. <laughs> I recommend it for everybody. <laughs> and uh, I just want to also acknowledge um, the sacrifices and the pain that my uh, wonderful wife, you know, <laughs> had to bear through <laughs> for years that I would just sing without worrying about it, whether I was in tune or not. And uh, she's somebody who's exceptionally good singer, and uh, I think it should be publicly acknowledged the sacrifices and the saintliness of uh, <laughs> the people who support us uh, throughout life. Um, so in Arabic, which is used in Turkish, um, uh, in Turkish tuning system. To be in tune, the word, and this is an Ottoman Turkish, the word was used, unsiyat. Beautiful word, unsiyat. The first time I heard it, I was like, wow, this is just remarkable. It's a way, again, a metaphorical way. Um, a metaphor not as just a figure of speech, metaphor as a way of thinking about one thing in terms of another thinking about one experience in terms of another. Unsiyat literally means intimacy. Intimacy. And from the same root, some Arabic grammarians derive the word for human being, insan, from the same root. There's actually two roots that they derive it from. One is uns, which means intimate or intimacy, and the other is nisyan, which means forgetfulness. So the definition of the human being according to this uh, derivation is a forgetful creature capable of intimacy, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so true, right? <laughs> so, and in contemporary Turkish though, um, you know, the word accord is used for tuning. When the two strings or your voice is in tune with something, you said, okay, they're in accord, right? And that's what is used in European languages too, so it came from the European languages. So this was a great uh, discovery for me because it showed how there was a basic bodily experience, a felt experience of singing, of relating to sounds that was being thought of in terms of human relationships. So a chord, from the root chord, to be of one heart, for two hearts to be in one, unsiyat, to be intimate, for things to become one. So that experience of being in tune, um, one of, so I was giving this background as a way to talk about the instructions that we found that we give to ourselves and to students. Uh, Laudin Matthew, he, um, he's a wonderful musician um, and I uh, love his writings. He's written a book called um, The Listening Book and this comes from that book, The Listening Book, in which he says, instructions on singing in tune with the string, he says, 
straighten out your back and let the sound of the drone, first you find a drone, you know, you let the sound of the drone fill you up, you sit up, and then sing inside the sound as if it were a ripe fruit and you were the sweetness inside. Isn't that? It's just amazing. But that's this idea of being contained in the withinness. And that totally changes for me at least, and I think for others too. It softens our singing. We don't try and kind of overpower. Like it's a very different way of trying to inhabit and relate to the sound with which we're creating a relationship, right? To really be within it, to be in the moment. So I'm offering this as a, um, I think as some practical suggestions for how what Rumi is saying and what cognitive science is telling us, how both can really be used very practically in our lives. This is not something that is, uh, you know, a veiled text. It's really talking about stuff that's happening here and now. So if we are able to be in the moment in one activity, we can transfer this to other one as well. That's the function and that's the question that is guiding our uh, explorations in those courses. Is it transferable? How do we train awareness in a way that one might also uh, relate to other realities in one's life, perhaps uh, in light of what one already knows how to do well? So all of us can do some things well. So states are places. So we think of states as places. So the Quran, as Rumi is telling us, that the Quran is a depiction of states all kinds of states. Those states are places. So hell, from this perspective, and this is helpful, right? I mean, um, it's not just a place, right? It's a state. Heaven is not just a place, it's also a state. And I think it's a useful way, a one useful way in being able to think about, I think, some of what Jesus has to say in his words as well, that the kingdom of God is not far, it is near. So when I think of it in terms of what Rumi is saying, I think I see some of that resonance too, that from the lived reality, the ready cash perspective, what is being pointed out is that you're here right now is what counts. Either you are close or you're far. Either you're in a good state or you're in a bad state. And how can you determine where you are at, what kind of a place it is, and what to do? That's the function of the teaching stories. So the path then to God, because where is God? There's a cosmology. I mean, this is where it's really interesting. I, uh, I um, as a former physics student, there was a time in my life where you know, I feel like I think it was, I, I was basically a materialist. And you know, the pre-modern things appeared uh, quite naive. You know, as a, somebody who knew modern physics, I would look at these old maps of the cosmos with the Earth at the center, you know, and all the heavens over here, and then the sun up there as being just one of the bodies. It's like, you know, it's so strange that they were thinking this, and I just didn't get it. Um, and uh, what has slowly opened up is um, the realization that those maps were not just maps of the way the world was. They were maps of the way the world is experienced by us. And that's a really huge distinction. And that that will forever be the same. There is no changing the fact that because we are all embodied and that we look at the world from these two eyes, that when I look up at the sky, what I see if I stand still long enough and start comparing over a period of time, I will see that there are some bodies that move in certain ways and those seven heavens will appear. That is what is being described is our lived experience. And through that, what is also being described is our interior landscape. The way the world is outside, just like warm is good, what the body is doing. In the same way, our interiority tends to be shaped by that as well. So those maps were not just uh, you know, objective maps of reality. They were also maps of our psyches as well. So cosmology and psychology in these pre-modern texts and pre-modern maps are really just two sides of the same coin. And I think we are now at a place where we have separated the two a little bit because of the developments in science. It is true that the Earth is not at the center of the solar system. You know? So we have to kind of hold both of those together and yet you know, we have to live in both of those worlds. 
that embodied, from an embodied perspective, my reality, your reality will never shift. We're always seeing the world from our eyes. But from the other perspective, that is another reality as well. <laughs> that um, the Earth does not revolve around the sun from that perspective. So the Quran, Rumi says, is a depiction of the states. Moses and Pharaoh are within your own being. So the journey to God, what is being seen as in terms of an outward journey, you're at a place you feel like you're so far away and you have to make an effort and walk through just like if I were wanted to go to the co-op and grab a cup of coffee afterwards, I have to overcome the raging river over which there's a bridge and stuff, right, from here. And uh, anyway, it's a journey, right? There can be obstacles in there, who knows? So that's the image outside, but on the interior landscape, what does it mean to journey to God? It is to move from state to state, you see. That's what's at stake. That's what Rumi's pointing out. And I think that's what really cognitive linguistics helps us understand. So we're talking about moving from a state of heedlessness, forgetfulness, envy, or pride to something that's a little bit more prophetic or saintly, but it's all within ourselves. And this is the interpretation that um, is given I'm not sure if Rumi exactly says this, but this is another great Muslim thinker who was, um, you know, same time period as Rumi died of like three decades before him, Ibn Arabi. His interpretation of this Quranic verse is really fascinating in this regard. There's a Quranic verse in which, again, you know, it's a flash forward, and God is asking people, why didn't you do these things? Why didn't you do these good things? And they say, you know, we were in a land where we were oppressed and uh, we, we were compelled, we just couldn't do this. So God's response to these folks is, is not my, was not my earth wide that you could have immigrated in it? Was not my earth wide that you could have immigrated in it? So Ibn Arabi talks about God's wide earth. And he says, it means on the inner plane, this discussion we're having right now of states, to migrate from a state of being compelled to a state of being openness because a journey is an interior journey that is being spoken of. So we have to immigrate from a place where a tyrant has a hold, our inner tyrant. We have to leave the land of the inner tyrant and move to another place. So that's immigration, an inner immigration. So outward texts that speak of outer realities are constantly referring back to inner realities, and that's the way in which the circle is ongoing. We shall show them our signs, the Quran says, in the horizons and in their own selves until they know that it is, the Quran, is the real. That is really talking about real things. We're not talking about you know, imaginary things here. Um, so that's one thing I wanted to point out, that that's the way to think about. I propose one way to think about that makes a lot of sense to me. I feel it's a coherent way of being able to think about it. And I think it does justice to the data that we find both from the texts the testimony of the people, and our own experience. And it is in keeping with this idea, with this very um, visceral, body-based, real kind of connection with ourselves that Rumi offers the criteria for figuring out whether one's own interpretation of scripture is correct or not. And if I forget, please remind me. I want to talk about the implication for also interpreting other stories. If I forget, please remind me. So, scripture coming in, reminding human beings of certain possibilities, ways of living that might be blessed, harmonious, flowing for oneself as well as for others, and possibilities that will arise if one does not act in certain ways. The hardship one causes oneself and others. So it's seen as a journey. Life is seen as a journey, and the goal is God. And there's a formula in the Quran that Muslims recite, especially when somebody dies. It's inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. We come from God and we go back to God. So the whole of life is seen as a journey to and back from. Come from God and we're going back to God. It's a circular journey. Um, so, in this journey then, the, what, what's at stake, as I'm saying, is how well we can live for ourselves and for others. So there's certain interpretations of the Quran that um, Rumi is very critical of. For example, 
there's um, a verse in the Quran which God says, God has created you and what you do. So one can say that, you know, my laziness is also created by God, so, you know, it's fine and... <laughs> So he is really keen to point out that um, that is not a good interpretation. <laughs> you know, there's also a hadith, a saying of the Prophet Muhammad that is used, that was used by certain scholars to argue for a radical notion of compulsion in human affairs. That people, you know, there's no free choice. We're just totally compelled, which is, I would say, a the theological way of making the social determinism point that we're totally determined by things that are outside our control. Genes, and it's true, right? I mean, like, it happens, like, this has happened with me with a couple of things, like, you get to a certain age and all of a sudden it's like some gene w woke up <laughs> within you, like, wow, okay, so I'm just like that uncle over there who's so, you know, so you see the same things, all of a sudden you're like, wow, I was carrying all of this, you know? So yeah, we, we do that, it's, it's true, you know, there's lots of things we have no control over, you know? Um, so there's a hadith, a saying of Muhammad, in which uh, is interpreted sometimes to mean that there's radical determinism, um, that we're totally compelled. It says the pen has dried. The pen is God writing out the world. So the pen works on the outside world, and the pen is God's logos, right? Creating things. So you know whatever has, has, needs to happen has already happened. And some people use that as a uh, reason for saying that pen has dried. What can one do? I'm just going to sit here and not pray because I'm not feeling like it, you know? So Rumi says, and it's, it's quite funny too because contrary to popular opinion, you know, Rumi curses a lot actually. And um, especially at places where he feels like somebody's not hearing and he'll really curse you out. Like the text, you know, so there, you know, there's parts of Rumi, like I said, that have been, you know, held back a little bit. So he will not shy away from uh, cursing. Um, so after, you know, you son of a so-and-so, why don't you interpret it in this way, he says, that the pen has dried in saying, and he says a Quranic verse, repeats a Quranic verse, that the reward of those who do the beautiful is not the same as the reward of those who do the ugly. The pen has draw, dried in saying that the striving of those who strive will be rewarded. So he's pointing out how much um, discretion we actually in, pragmatically speaking, in our lived reality, have in making a interpretation. We actually choose, Rumi's pointing out, to interpret th things certain way. And it's at that moment of choice that he wants to keep us bringing back to. So in this journey towards God, which interiorly we can see as choosing to move from a state to a different state, choosing to, you know, try and work at it. It's possible that it won't work, but still trying is important. He says, how do you know if something is true? An interpretation is true if it makes you warm, hopeful, and modest. An interpretation of the Quran, right, is true if it makes you warm, hopeful, and modest. And if it makes you slow, then know this truth. It is a distortion and not an interpretation. Because interpretation, the word that Rumi is using for interpretation is the word called ta'wil. It comes from the root awwal. Awwal means first. Ta'wil literally means taking something back to its root. So he's trying to point out the Quran was, you know, then you have not really re verified the reality of what it is trying to say. You have actually changed it on a more outward fashion. You have not figured out its reality. Right. An interpretation is true if it makes you warm, hopeful, and modest. And if it makes you slow, then know this truth. It is a distortion and not an interpretation. The Quran has come to quicken us and to hold the hands of those who have lost hope. That's the purpose of scripture. The Quran or scripture has come to quicken us and to hold the hands of those who have lost hope. So that's the criteria. It's a pragmatic criteria. Pragmatic, but it's based on experience. We know the moments and times where we made a choice that actually opened up the path or the way. Maybe it was a choice about um, rather than hiding behind feelings 
of um, anger or dissatisfaction at a loved one, we decided to move through and connect. Right? Because obviously, there also have been moments where we have chosen to stay in that place of resentment. Place of resentment, right? It's a feeling and it's a place. We stayed in resentment. And there are other places where we, times when we somehow, either, whatever happened, we moved. We did not, we say, I'm not going to stay here. I'm going to move. I'm going to reach out. So that's really, it's as simple as that. That's what he's pointing out. It's about making the beautiful choice, the hard choice in many ways, because it's much easier. Because there's so much meaning in resentment, isn't there? You know? I mean, that's why I think soap operas are so popular. <laughs> totally. I mean, it clicked. I remember when it first clicked for me because, and I see this happening now with uh, our son as well, and he, you know, he's constantly telling stories. And I think all of us have a very rich interior life, and, you know, we live inside stories, we tell stories, we fantasize. Um, and uh, I guess all of us are uh, the heroes of our stories, you know? And uh, somehow, a lot of those stories don't work out <laughs> outwardly. So we, so we can be, you know, we can be resentful about that fact. And that resentment can become so great that sometimes we might be resentful about life, about where we find ourselves. I think that's the, a very root kind of uh, resentment that it can lead to. Whereas the goal is that, as Rumi is pointing out, wherever we are, especially if it's a hellish state, meaning we're in hell, a place, we need to move. Let's immigrate. Let's move from that place. And the way to do that is to make a good interpretation. That is our uh, function. That is within our power. Make a good interpretation. And that's, I think, now to uh, go back to the point I wanted to make. I think what Rumi is speaking about scripture, right? Because the Quranic verse, the signs are in our souls, in the scripture, and in the outside. So there's also stories being told outside, the scripture of outside. Others are telling stories. Sometimes there's ways in which we can interpret the stories being told by others that are also helpful in moving forward and making us warm as opposed to interpreting it in a way that might be less helpful. For example, somebody's actions, rather than attributing it to malice, we might just say, oh, that person must be under a lot of pressure. That's an interpretation, you see. We might give some other reason. We might make an interpretation that makes us warm and hopeful and modest, as opposed to angry, resentful, and stuck. So that's the pragmatic criteria that Rumi is offering. And I think because of the way in which he offers it, it's a real key that allows us to see not only the function of scripture, the Quran in this case, but the real value of it and how it is not about writing lengthy tomes. It's about working consciously with ourselves so that we can live a life that is blessed. That's going back to the first chapter of the Quran, the path of those whom you have blessed. And I think what Rumi is really trying to point out to us is that the blessing, a big part of the blessing, is within our own power. We can choose to live a blessed life by making good interpretations. So, let me leave you with this. An interpretation is true if it makes you warm, hopeful, and modest. And if it makes you slow, then know this truth. It is a distortion and not an interpretation. So we are actually out of time, so I'm sorry. I think uh, we can't really take questions to let people leave who need to leave at noon. So thank you so much. Look forward to seeing you next week. <laughs> A pleasure. <laughs>